theatral area. We find ourselves in what Evans called the theatral area. Notice the stone structure at the southeast corner, between the two banks of steps. Some imagine a political ruler watching ceremonies here, surrounded by over 500 people. We find ourselves on the southernmost part of present-day Greece, on the island of Crete. The purpose of our journey, Knossos generally, and the understanding of the past in the present and future specifically. Some have called it the Palace of Knossos, while others explain why using present-day language to describe the past will always create problems but more on the role of language later in this tour. Since 1212 AD, Crete was under Venetian rule, followed by the rule of the Turkish Ottoman Empire since 1669. Little was heard from the island internationally until struggles for independence began in the 19th century. Western travelers began flocking to the island, drawn by the romantic scenery and thirst for oriental exoticism. This also began the international interest shown mm. in one of the many ancient sites of Crete, Knossos. After ample battle and ow, rivalry ow, ow. between archaeologists ow. and institutions ow. of the West, Arthur John Evans, with the help of his connections and affluent background, gained access to begin the excavation at Knossos in 1900. It was Evans who baptized the habitants and culture there as Minoan, from the myth of Minos. Evans' unique combination of skills, intentions, and personality resulted in what can never be reproduced nor reoccur. An archaeological site rebuilt or reconstituted. Evans' work at Knossos was not only digging to find antiquities, but trying to actually rebuild the ancient site according to his vision, to piece together what he called the Palace of Knossos and try to achieve what it looked like almost 4,000 years before his time. An impossible task. After all, no one can know for certain what the past looked like. Minoan Basics It is thought that the Minoan civilization existed between 1900 to 1100 BC. This means Minoan civilization had already disappeared 600 years prior to the classical period in Athens. Knossos is said to have influences from Egyptian culture. In modern times, the interest Western institutions showed in Knossos gradually grew starting in 1878, through the findings and efforts of Minos Kalokirinos. Knossos was built in the fertile valley of the Keratos River, with North Entrance. This is one of the four entrances of the complex. North Pillar Hall. This area is called the Pillar Hall. Evans also referred to it as the Customs House. 
due to its hypothetical use as an inspection point for imported goods arriving from the harbor. Europa's myth and the birth of Minos. You may have heard of Knossos as the setting of elaborate myths, of stories of the labyrinth, or rivalries between gods and mortals. Minos, a central figure in the many myths of Knossos. Myth has it that Minos had divine origin. He is the son of god Zeus and Europa, daughter of the Phoenician king. Upon seeing Europa picking flowers by the sea, Zeus falls in love with her and decides to transform himself into a bull in order to approach her. Europa mounts the back of the playful creature, which quickly plunges into the sea, bringing her to Crete. It was there that their three sons were born, one of which was Minos. Soon after, Europa marries Asterios, king of the island of Crete. After the death of Asterios, Minos becomes king of the island. North Entrance Passage the north entrance passage we are now traversing was initially built wider. Its narrower form was attained during the Neopalatial era, when the stone structures you see on both sides were added. The Myth of the Minotaur Venus marries Pasiphae, daughter of Ilios and the nymph Crete. Together, they live in Knossos with their four sons and four daughters. <laughs> to justify his accession as king, Minos prays for Poseidon's help. Out of the sea, Poseidon sends a fine white bull, which Minos commits to sacrifice to the god. But Minos likes the bull so much that he decides to keep it and sacrifice another in its place. This deception causes such wrath to Poseidon that in return he makes Pasiphae acquire a consuming love for the white bull. From their union, the Minotaur, half human, half bull, is born and is forced by Minos to live in isolation in the labyrinth. The Minotaur is condemned to be seen as a monster. Bull Relief Fresco North Passage This fresco relief of a bull with olive trees and rocks may have depicted bull hunting, 1600 to 1500 BC. Central Court we are now at the central court, the core of the complex. Some imagine that bull-leaping rituals might have taken place here. Architecture born from art. How can we... Central court. We are now at the central court, the core of the complex. Some imagine that bull-leaping rituals might have taken place here. The central court was also the source of light and air the surrounding apartments. Limits of language. 
When unearthing a culture which disappeared so long ago, an archaeologist usually faces the impossible riddle of how to refer to the findings. So when referring to Knossos and Minoan civilization, to the names of rooms, objects, or artifacts, we must remember that the names we are using are the names Evans gave. The renowned French historian Alexander Farnu wrote, The first problem faced by Evans was the matter of what to name the civilization. Should it be Knossian, on the model of Schliemann's Mycenaean, or perhaps Cretomycenaean? In the end, Evans decided to baptize the civilization as Minoan, from the myths of Minos. Anteroom of the throne room. This room may have been used for the purification of those entering the throne room. It was here that Evans placed a wooden replica of the original throne. At Knossos today, one can see the stone benches here blackened by the fire, which many believe destroyed Knossos. Throne room. Evans named the throne or chair. King, queen, or neither. French historian Alexander Farnu writes, Like Schliemann, who a few decades earlier had telegraphed King George I of Greece that he had just discovered the tombs of the Homeric kings, <laughs> Evans invited the modern-day king of uh? the Hellenes to sit on mm. the oldest throne of Europe. The throne room, one of the most well-known reconstructions at Knossos today, was so named because it contained something that reminded Evans of a throne. However, even he could not decide if it was a seat for a king or a queen. Little did he realize that the question of who sat on this chair may itself have been misleading. Throne Room Evans named this room the Throne Room, after the throne-like chair he found here, one of his first finds at Knossos. At the time of the excavation, the seat was called the oldest known throne in Europe. In recent times, it served as inspiration for the design of the presidential chair of the Hague's International Court. Conversations with the Columns Red, a Minoan stereotype Did you know that the color palettes Conversations with the Columns Red, a Minoan stereotype did you know that the color palettes used by Arthur Evans and since are open to debate? We may be used to seeing red columns as a symbol of Knossos, but more recent findings show that the art of Knossos had a specific color palette to include red, blue, and yellow. This means that one color defined broader categories. Red could have been used to convey brown and orange. Blue could have been used to convey green or gray. The red columns may be an example of how Evans interpreted the fresco pieces he found in a literal way. Upon seeing a fresco depicting reddish columns, Evans decided to paint the actual columns red as well. Controversial Concrete The red columns of Knossos have become a worldwide symbol of this time, place, and culture which Evans called Minoan. They have become part of our collective memory. Little do we realize, though, that these columns hide secrets of guesswork, hypothesis, and interpretation. The columns are very much of Evans' time, as they are built of cement, a novel material in the late 19th century when they were constructed. As cement did not exist during the Minoan time, its use in the reconstitution was a controversial one as this material could not have been used in the original structure. 
Columns Misinterpreted Today, many archaeologists believe that the columns were in fact not red. As no traces of the original columns have been found on site, it is believed that they were made of wood, a material which disintegrates through the passing of time, explaining why no pieces have been recovered. By researching the local wood on Crete, some suggest that the original columns may have been made of walnut, olive, or beechwood, meaning that they would have most likely been brown. There are also doubts about the shape of the columns. Were they inverted, as Evans and his team have represented them? Or would they have been... East Hall. Evans considered this area to have been a reception hall, and possibly the actual throne room, since it was here that he envisioned a king exercising political authority. A wooden statue of a goddess may have been standing in this hall. Overlooking the central court, one can easily associate the floor level with the terrace level of the Piano Nobile opposite, where the halls of the western quarter were situated. The myth of Theseus and the Minotaur. Where we last left the myth of Minos, he locked the Minotaur in the labyrinth. To avoid the eyes of others, to hide away royal secrets, as the myth of the Minotaur continues, more people come into the story. Minoan myths are full of many different characters, sometimes too many names to remember. Androgios, son of Minos, years later travels to Athens to participate in the Panathenic Games. His victories cause jealousy to many, leading to his murder. Upon hearing the news of the murder of his son, Minos wages a war against Athens and wins. In another version of the myth, the king of Athens is forced to pay penalties for the murder to Minos. Both versions of the myth lead to an agreement that Athens must send seven boys and seven girls each year to Crete, as feast for the Minotaur locked away in the labyrinth of Knossos. Years pass. Theseus, son of Aegeus, king of Athens, decides to join the youth sent to Crete in order to kill the Minotaur. He promises his father that if he survives, he will put up a white flag on the returning ship to let him know he is still alive. Upon arriving at Crete, Ariadne, daughter of Minos, falls madly in love with Theseus. She gives him a ball of yarn to help him navigate the labyrinth and know how to find his way out of the maze. Theseus finds and kills the Minotaur and leads the rest of the young Athenians out safely. On the journey back, Myth has it that Theseus leaves Ariadne on the island of Naxos with the demigod Dionysus, who has fallen in love with her. In the meantime, Theseus forgets to raise the white flag on the ship, which makes his father think he is dead. Full of sorrow, King Aegeus commits suicide by leaping off the edge of Cape Sunion. It is said that the Aegean Sea is named after him. This leaves Theseus as ruler of Athens. Some believe this myth was symbolic of the end of Minoan dominance. Myths Between Fact and Fiction Who wrote the myths of Knossos? When? Why? How have they survived until today? What messages are conveyed through the myths of Knossos? Myths are stories, but are they literal? Do they describe actual events? Every culture or group of people has its own sets of myths, a series of stories they tell about nature, history, and customs. After 1850, a few decades before Evans arrived at Knossos, Western scholars became increasingly interested in studying myths in different cultures. Various scholars began giving a range of explanations of what myths are. Some believed myths were personifications of natural phenomena and nature, Others believed myths to be exaggerated accounts of historical events. In the 19th century, there were also those who viewed myths as primitive ways of explaining science and an outdated mode of thought not to be taken too seriously. In the 20th century, this separation of myth and science has been rejected. Myths have been used by various scientists as clues for understanding the psychology of people in different cultures, their beliefs, and way of being in the world. As Guy Lanou, the renowned anthropologist noted, moderns are not obliged to abandon myth for science. Some believe that myths tell us truths about all humans, 
but others are hesitant to make such sweeping generalizations. It is said that a story is told differently depending on who tells it. Who tells the stories of myths? Who is the narrator? This is often not clear. Look closely and you may find different versions of the same myth. As myths spread, different narrators may alter them, depending on their own beliefs and cultural needs. Myths are all around us, even today, such as in fantasy novels or Japanese manga. They convey messages about the culture that produces them. Its values, norms, fears and questions, hopes and dreams. They are not to be taken lightly. Myths used to be passed on orally, but today they are transmitted through films, television, and video games, leading to an even broader audience. Technology helps in spreading myths, past or present. Food for thought. How do we see these present day myths of ours? Griffin's Fresco, East Hall. The griffin is a creature with the body of a lion and the head and wings of an eagle. As the lion in some cultures has traditionally been considered the king of the beasts and the eagle king of the birds, the griffin was thought to be an especially powerful and majestic creature. In mythology, griffins are known for guarding treasures. East Hall. Evans considered this area to have been a reception hall and possibly the actual throne room, since it was here that he envisioned a king exercising political authority. A wooden statue of a goddess may have been standing in this hall. Overlooking the central court, one can easily associate the floor level with the terrace level of the Piano Nobile opposite, where the halls of the western quarter were situated. Grand Staircase The Grand Staircase was considered by Evans the ultimate achievement of Minoan architecture due to its complex design. He imagined that going up and down these broad steps, with the sunlight penetrating through the large light well, must have been a great feeling. Behind the myth, the Minotaur misunderstood. So now, let's go back to the myth of the Minotaur. Notice that the myth is not told by any of the characters but by an unknown narrator. How might the story be told through the eyes of the Minotaur? In the most well-known version of the myth, the love affair of Pasiphae and the white bull is meant to function as Minos's punishment for not fulfilling his promise to Poseidon. The birth of the Minotaur, the offspring of the affair, appears to function as a time-enduring reminder to Minos of his mistake. Let's replace the characters of the story Labyrinth mislabeled. The architecture of Knossos is often referred to as maze-like, as a labyrinth, a place someone could easily get lost in. But some scholars studying the structure of Knossos today find a great degree of organization, which suggests a different story. Each culture has its own way of understanding and using space, depending on the needs of the society, the values, and structure of daily life. If we think of space as a kind of language one learns to read from birth, we learn to read or navigate spaces in our own cultures, but in visiting new places, we may have trouble finding our way around. King's Hall, or the Hall of the Double Axes. Evans called this area the King's Hall, or the Hall of Double Axes, due to the double axes symbols he found on the light well walls. During summers, the west light well would have served as a natural air vent, sucking the warm air up so that the space could be ventilated when cooler air was drawn through the open doors. In the winter, the room was most likely heated up by portable hearths. Queen's Hall There are five different ways of accessing this room. 
This reflects a multiplicity in the entering and exiting of this space, located in the domestic quarter, as Evans called it. The space lights up through the multiple openings looking into the light wells. Queen's Toilet, or Queen's Lavatory. Evans believed this was the Queen's Lavatory. There may have been a wooden seat above a large drain. In front of the entrance on the floor, there is a curved stone with a hole through it, which functioned by inserting clean water, similar to flushing a drain. The drainage system passes under the grand staircase and the King's and Queen's halls and directs the water from the lavatory and the light wells to the river. Central Court. We are now at the Central Court, the core of the complex. Some imagine that bull leaping rituals might have taken place here. The Central Court was also the source of light and air for the surrounding of Priest King. The reconstitution of the so called Priest King is one of the most circulated images of Minoan art. Three ancient fragments of painted plaster, Central Court. We are now at the central court, the core of the complex. Some imagine that bull leaping rituals might have taken place here. The central court was also the source of light and procession corridor fresco. The fresco in the procession corridor depicts men and women carrying seemingly valuable objects. Procession Corridor, the fresco of the procession. Procession Corridor, West Entrance. This corridor was named after the theme of the fresco on its walls that shows fig West Porch. This porch would have protected the entrance from rain and wind. A paved causeway connects the porch with a the theatral area and the Royal Road. At Outro The Art of Building Ruins After a 35-year-long excavation, Evans has been dubbed the Builder of Ruins and Knossos a modern ruin even the best well-kept monument of the Art Nouveau period in Greece. The Knossos we see today is not prehistoric Knossos, but the Knossos of Evans, of the modern architecture movement. And Knossos in this eye guide is our interpretation of it. Although Knossos was studied to the greatest degree possible in Evans' time, it remains part reconstruction, part fantasy. Evans' interpretations have been strongly questioned since his time, by generations after him. His bias has been gradually revealed since his death in 1941, with debates of even undoing his reconstitution. Like separating oil from water, such an act would be impossible today. His work has changed Knossos so much that the two have become irreversibly intertwined. Knossos is without a doubt full of dreams and ideals, a collage of past, present, 
and future. If we understand the past and our interpretations of it, we are better equipped to understand the future and foresee what is to come. Generations of archaeologists, after Evans, have tried to revisit sites such as Knossos, recognizing that archaeology is not a neutral ground. It is a process of selection, highly charged. Archaeologists, after Evans' time, working in indigenous, feminist, and queer archaeology, for example, have made important contributions underlying not only what Evans focused on, but the choices he made and what he decided to leave out. To revisit Knossos means to face a world full of what-ifs and impossible promises to imagine what is no longer. We can never return to know what really happened at Knossos or what it really looked like. We cannot taste their tastes nor smell their scents, but we can try to make a space to imagine, as Evans also did, acknowledging the challenges and ethics of decision-making and the power of the narratives we create. Knossos can only be seen through Evans' vision of it, his dream of what he wished to restore. It is his desire for the Knossos he wished to see and rematerialize. A dream built in three dimensions. What is important to remember from our journey through this hypothetical Knossos is not so much to learn little trivia, but to understand the reconstitution as a language to be decoded and understood. To understand what led to the modern and contemporary myths that surround Knossos today. The fine line between myth and history as uncovered by archaeology. What is important to always remember is that archaeology often says more about the time the site was excavated than about the past itself. Knossos has been called by some a monument of the 20th century, a product of its time and of the early stages of modern Western archaeology. While critiquing Evans, we must always remember that he was a man of his time and context. Knowing what we do today, the same Knossos would not exist. West Porch This porch would have protected the entrance from rain and wind. A paved causeway connects the porch with a the theatral area and the Royal Road. Evans considered this the most elaborately planned feature of the complex. West Entrance Evans considered this point the ceremonial entrance to the Knossos complex. Outer Entrance System on the West The outer entrance system consisted of a wall surrounding the terrace of the West Court. A ramp led up to the platform of the terrace via an entrance passage. Evans believed the small walled enclosure served as an exterior guard room. The two causeways, running across the West Court in different directions, were quite accurately defined. Kuluras, West Court. The three circular wall pits were named Kuluras by Cretan workmen. They may have been used as sacred repositories, as well as blind wells, for the disposal of water that collects on the surface of the ground. theatral area. We find ourselves in what Evans called the theatral area. <laughs> 